Welcome to Constitutional Chats, hosted by me, Janine Turner, and Kathy Gillespie, with students, Dakari Chapman, and me, Tova Kaplan. Join us as we discuss hot topic issues with constitutional experts. It's sponsored by Constituting America. Constitutional Chats. My name is Janine Turner. I'm an actress by trade. You can go to JanineTurner.com and check out all that. But I'm also the founder and co-president of Constituting America. And um, I host, co-host this with Kathy Gillespie. Kathy Gillespie is co-president of Constituting America. And like I, I always say, um, America's like a wing. It takes a left wing and a right wing to fly. And I'm not making any political statement with that. Uh, but Kathy, I'm like, if it were not for Kathy, I'd still be flapping around trying to get all my projects off the ground. So Say hello, Kathy. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here today. She was a see, um, chief of staff on the Hill forever, but she also is one of the elite few, 16 only, picked to be on the semi-quincentennial commission to plan the 250th birthday of America, the celebration. So Kathy Gillespie is just quite an extraordinary person, and we're lucky to have her. Uh, doing this with us. Okay, but I'm also going to introduce an extraordinary 16-year-old. We call, we include uh, Tova, Dakari, and everything we do. They help us pick the subjects. They can ask their own questions. And very, very often our guests will say, that's a really good question to them um, because they're so brilliant. And we, we adore Tova. And Tova Love Kaplan is 16 years old. She's from Chicago, Illinois. And she has won our contest three times. We have a We the Future contest. For all the students out there and the parents and the teachers, we have wonderful contests. You win money, you win trips, you get to star in documentaries. Uh, many get to be on our youth advisory board. Um, not only that, uh, let's see, you take a trip to Washington, D.C., you meet with a mentor, and we promote your works. Our song winners and public service announcement commercial winners have, uh, been, have had millions of hits and millions of plays on television and radio. And, our STEM winners have started in documentaries. So we, we continue to work with our winners for years and years afterwards. And we've known Tova for, gosh, about three or four years now. She's won our We the Future contest three times. Left brain, right brain, everybody. She won the first time for Entrepreneurial Project when she was in middle school, giving us a marketing plan. Then she won for Best Public Service Announcement, which was a commercial, of course, um, which was fantastic. She stars in it, directed it, wrote it, produced it. And then she also won for best app this past year where she created an app for Constituting America, which we need to get that up. We need to add that to our list. But she's extraordinarily talented and she really believes in the United States Constitution is just a fantastic spokesperson for Constituting America. She's the, the National Youth Director for Constituting America and runs an exceptional youth advisory board with all of our winners from 10 years ago all the way up to today. So Tova Love Kaplan, please say hello. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoy the show. <laughs> and now William Morrissey, our fantastic, wonderful William Morrissey, Professor Morrissey. Let me tell you all about Professor Morrissey. He, is, he has worked with us for Constituting America. He has, by the way, the, this uh, uh, subject today, the 17th Amendment, we have an essay up at constitutingamerica.org because we have not 90 day studies that always start around President's Day in February and run through, you know, quite a while because they're a little sometimes over 90 days. And uh, Professor Morrissey has designed many, many of these uh, 90 day studies for us. And he's written many essays for us. He is just fantastic. So Professor Morrissey is um, the, um, at the politics of Hillsdale College, where he has um, held the William and Patricia Lamoth Chair and the, UN, and the U.S. Constitution. He has a new book coming out this summer, Herman Melville's Ship of State. I want to hear what that's all about. We are so blessed to have had Professor Morrissey's help, as I was saying, with, with uh, many years of Constituting America. Professor Morrissey has designed our studies, and he's written over 36 essays for our studies over the years. That's a lot. Many times he opens the study for us, which is the most prestigious opening spot. Um, he's been one of our mentors, and we all had a dinner with him, a candlelight dinner at Mount Vernon, George Washington's estate. I remember that. He joined uh, that as a mentor for Constituting America winners in 2015. 
His other books, you should check out all of those books, include um, Self-Government, and another one is The American Theme, Presidents of the Founding and Civil War, and another one is The Dilemma of Progressivism, How Ro Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson Reshaped the American Regime of Self-Government, self and Churchill and de Gaulle, The Geopolitics of Liberty. All sound fascinating. Professor Morrissey, welcome to our constitutional chats. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me to it. Okay, so now do you want to start uh, with kind of telling us about the 17th Amendment? Do you have a little PowerPoint? I don't know. Or do you want us to just top in with questions? Uh, well, I'll just briefly, the, uh, the original Constitution, as you know, uh, was uh, the, the U.S. Senators were selected by the state legislatures. And uh, the, the 17th Amendment made them selected by the voters in each state. So they were popularly elected. That's the change. And it turns out that it's a very important change. And it was understood to be an important change at the time. So I'll be happy to answer questions about it. I can give you more background on it. I can talk about why. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, go, we'll, we'll ask questions as we go, because I love to give the opportunity for Tova to ask questions, and for Kathy to ask questions, and for listeners to ask questions. So we'll start. Um, I guess, Professor Morrissey, um, you know, the Constitution was designed, as you just said, so that the Senate was, was really representing the states. So you had a president that represented the entire country, the Senate that represented the states, and the House that represented the people. And it was really multi-tiered in a beautiful way where the people, the states, and the federal government all were working in concert. And then they changed it with the 17th Amendment. And so, as you said, the states would send two elected legislators to go to become the senators. So the state governments picked the senators because they were going to represent the states. And then that changed. A lot, of, a lot of us are very concerned about that because it, it changed the whole dynamic of the Constitution. Why don't you tell us why our founding fathers felt that having the Senate represent the states and be appointed by the state legislatures was important, and then why, why there was this movement to change that? Okay, first of all, the original intention of the founders. Um, you'll find that discussed in three of the Federalist Papers. That's number 44 by Madison, number 59, which was written by Alexander Hamilton, and then 62 by Madison again. Um, the, the 44th Federalist, Madison, is defending the necessary and proper clause in the Constitution. If you look at your, your pocket constitutions, I have mine available right here. Uh, the the, the uh, article, article 8, Section 1, uh, excuse me, Article 1, Section 8, enumerates the different powers that Congress has. In a federal government, the general government is going to have certain specified powers that, that it, uh, certain things that it can do, such as, for example, I'm reading right off the top here, borrowing money on the credit of the United States, uh, regulating commerce with foreign states, interstate commerce, um, uh, naturalization laws, coining money, uh, declaring war, those, they're all enumerated powers of the Congress, enumerated in the Constitution. And that's really important because that means the federal, the, the federal Congress can do those things. They have those powers, but they don't have any powers that are not mentioned in the Constitution. The states get all those powers. So, for example, the, the state can regulate its internal commerce. See, uh, not interstate, but its internal commerce. It can, um, it can uh, st tell municipalities uh, what kind of uh, zoning laws they're entitled to have within certain limits, that kind of thing. So what the Necessary and Proper Clause does is to say that Congress can pass all laws that are necessary and proper to, the, um, to, to implement these, uh, these authorities that they have. So for example, to implement interstate commerce, you're going to need statutory law, not constitutional law, to get down to the details. See what I'm saying? So, so if you, so the necessary- Okay, proper, Professor, Morris, yeah. Professor Morris, I'm interrupt. Since we're speaking to some middle school students and some, you know, I don't know how the ages of the students high school, explain to the younger students what statutory means. You know, statutory. a lot of people don't understand what all this means. It's yeah. a little Constitu complicated. 
me to keep it as simple as possible. Or explain, explain those big words, please. Okay, Constit uh, constitutional law is uh, ratified by the people of the United States. It is the fundamental law of the land. It sets up the, what the Constitution constitutes is the federal or general government of the United States. Um, the statutory laws are passed by the general government, right? They're passed through Congress, signed by the president, and they, they, they are not constitutional laws. They are uh, laws that can be amended easily, uh, you, uh, the Constitution cannot be amended easily, right? You need to, uh, to ratify constitutional amendments, and that takes three quarters of the states to do. So, so the more fundamental law is the constitutional law. It constitutes the actual government of the United States. The statutory laws are passed by that government, um, and they can be amended uh, by simple majorities of, of, within both houses of Congress. Okay, great. So, so why the change? What they, they, they wanted a separation of powers. They wanted a separation of powers with the states um, to have have their what the dynamic shifted with the Seventeenth Amendment. So, tell us how the why why was it not working? Why was there a movement? Now, before 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 I do that, I have to tell you why they had it in the first place. Now you've got this. You've got the Constitution in play, right? in order to structure the government in such a way so that it doesn't become oppressive, so that that necessary and proper clause is not a, a gateway to Congress doing whatever it wants, right? What uh, Madison says in Federalist 44 is that, look, under the Constitution, the state governments will be, in effect, a constituent part of the federal government because they will be selecting the senators who, uh, who, who represent the states. See that? So in other words, he's, he's saying basically that the, they, they are, he's, the, the quote is that they are the constituent and essential parts of the federal government. They've got their own branch of government, so to speak. The state governments do. See that? So that's, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the link between the state governments and the federal government. It gives the states the assurance that their, con their integrity will be respected. The integrity of their legislation, their powers will be respected. They've got a voice within the, the federal government. A, uh, Madison calls it a convenient link between the state governments and the federal government. Very important. Now, you asked about uh, why they wanted to change it. The, 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 there were several objections to the, um, to, to the way that, it, that this was, that the, uh, uh, the Constitution was written with respect to uh, selection of senators. Uh, one was that uh, in, the, in the 1890s, there was a lot of ferment in the country about influence over state legislatures by uh, corporate interests. And uh, if, you, if you go back to the original idea of, 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 of the problem with any kind of government, um, back as far as Aristotle in the fourth century BC, what does he say? He says that, that there, the, there's a basic fact factionalism within any, in any system of government. There are the many who are poor and the few who are rich. And he says that the many who, and they're both just as bad, the few who are rich are going to want to dominate and, uh, and grind down the many who are poor. They want to get as much work out of them for as little pay as possible. The many who are poor are no better. They want to grind down the rich and take their money. So what um, uh, Aristotle suggests is that you have a bicameral legislature in which the many who are, few, are poor are represented in one branch, the few who are rich are represented in the other. All, the only laws that could get passed, enacted for the whole society, would be passed by both houses. You see the advantage to that. That's what he's trying to do. That's called a mixed regime, balanced regime. Now, the, 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 um, um, in, in the 1890s, what the what uh, American many of these Americans, particularly farmers in the Midwest and West, were saying, ranchers and farmers were saying, "Look, we are being dominated by the financial interests on the East Coast, the bankers, 
and they and those bankers are corrupting the state legislatures so that when they send senators to Washington, those senators don't really represent the states anymore. They represent the financial interests. And, uh, and, and the other thing was that they were worried also when, when, a, when a state, um, in 1866, the uh, federal government passed a statutory law, not a constitutional law, but a statutory law, saying that if you if you if you elected someone to, uh, to the U.S. Senate from your legislature, that person had to have a majority vote within the legislature. What that meant was that a lot of leg state legislatures would get deadlocked. There'd be three or four candidates. Nobody would get a majority within the state legislature, and as a result. The uh, Senate would, uh, would would be without a legisl without a senator from that state uh, for many for many months until the deadlock was resolved. Um, that was the that was the, those were the two main issues um, that were uh, concerning the the people who were in favor of this amendment. That is so fascinating. See, I've already learned so much. I'm already writing all my notes of everything I've learned from you, Professor. I think it's really interesting. I, I'm going to toss this to uh, Tova. I think it's really interesting that the bicameral of what I love, I love the philosophers. I read Socrates to Sartre. I love the philosophers. And that Aristotle talked about the, the rich try to dominate and the, the poor try to grind down. And, and, uh, and that, so he, rec he recommended bicameral, um, mm. which is just interesting. That's what our founding fathers were so rich, steeped in the knowledge of history and, and, in, and in philosophy. And so uh, I'm sure the bicameral had been, they knew about the Aristotle's position and, and the whole, and, and England does that. England definitely has the branch that's yeah. the arist aristocracy and the one of the people, which is which? The, the House of Lords originally was the House of Lords. It was the aristocracy. Oh. The House of Commons was, that, was for, the, for everybody else. At the time of the founding, the United States had the biggest franchise, voting franchise in the world, the widest number of people could vote. Uh, the House of Commons really only allowed about 15% of the English to, to actually vote in their elections. So although they were commoners, they weren't aristocrats, there weren't, it wasn't a big representative of, a representation of commoners. And what happened in the 19th century was that they gradually widened out the franchise to include just about everybody. There were several reform acts during the 19th century. And by the end of the 19th century, just about every adult male in the country could vote. Uh, United States pretty much started out that way, at least in terms of the, uh, uh, white male population, which was, even though that's restricted by our standards, it was much broader uh, than anywhere else in the world at the time. At the time, yeah, we always have to keep in mind history. Um, and I also like, as Tova, here you come, the state governments were respected uh, when, when, the, in the, in the, when it was before the 17th Amendment, the federal government actually respected what the states had to say. I think we've lost a lot of that, which is where we'll go in our, our conversation. Okay, Toba, your turn. All right, thank you. So I was wondering if you could elaborate more on the historical context that this amendment came from. Why did people push for this amendment at that specific point in history? You know, why didn't it happen earlier? Why didn't it happen later? What was going on in the country at that time that made people so um, like so willing to push for this big change in government. Right, that's, um, that's, uh, that goes back to the Civil War. Um, in the Civil War, what, what happened before the Civil War, the, 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 the money in the United States was gold and silver. There was no paper money in the United States. It's all gold and silver. And that was called the bimetallism, meaning two metals, gold and silver. During the Civil War, the both sides, both the Confederacy and the Union side, had to pay the soldiers. They didn't have uh, the, the United States stick with the North, the United States. They didn't have enough money in the Treasury, enough gold and silver in the Treasury to pay these people. That could cause a great problem, couldn't it? Because then the soldiers might turn around and march on the Capitol instead of marching on the Confederacy. So what they had to do, that Lincoln has a dilemma. Uh, what are we going to do to pay these soldiers? One idea, of course, would have been to go into debt to foreign banks. 
but of course that would have led us, that would have compromised our, our, the sovereignty of the United States. So they didn't want to do that. Uh, he got a recommendation from, I believe, one of the congressmen at the time to do this, issue paper money, sometimes called fiat money. Fiat means it's, it's by decree of the government, uh, paper money that would be based on the credit of the United States. The idea is that if you believe the United States will repay this debt at some point, that will, um, uh, you will accept this money as legitimate currency. That's exactly what they did. They called them greenbacks. And they were called greenbacks because the back of, the, of this paper money was printed in green ink. So after, so this, this, what does this do? This means that they can, they, the, 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 uh, the soldiers can now be paid by money that they trust because they figure they'll get, uh, it, it's good money. Uh, now, what happens is that after the war, the, the, the banks don't like paper money in those days. Why not? Because, and this goes back to this issue of the, uh, the few who are rich and the many are who are poor. If you, what is money worth actually? What is a piece of coin or, or a paper dollar bill really worth? It's worth money, the money supply, the total supply of money is, has a worth in relationship to what? To the, to the total economic output of the country, right? In other words, if the economic output is at a certain level and the, um, and the money supply is at a certain level, no matter what kind of money it is, you have a state and it, and it stays in that same ratio, that same relationship over time, then you have a stable currency, stable value for your currency. But if you print a lot of money suddenly and the, 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 the economic power, the economic activity, the GDP, the, the, uh, the, uh, um, um, the, the, the amount of economic activity uh, stays the same, then the amount of e the, the value of each dollar bill will be less, won't it? It's called inflation, right? Whereas if you have a lot of economic activity and the money supply doesn't keep pace with the, with the economic activity, then the value of each dollar bill will be more, right? That's called deflation, see what I'm saying? So what the bankers want the, 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 if, you're, if, if you're a banker, what do you want? You want to lend money at interest. So that means if you can, you'd like to have your, the money that you lend out one year be worth more when the loan comes due two years from now, right? In other words, if $100 is worth, uh, 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 is worth what it's worth now, and I've got a loan, uh, I've got a loan out to you, Saying, uh, saying you have to pay me $100 plus interest. Well, if that money is worth more in two years from now, that's good for me. Now, if the money supply is inflated, however, then that's good for you. You want, the infl you want inflation because then you'll be paying me back in money that isn't worth as much. See that? So that's a basic tension between lenders and borrowers or the rich and the poor the few who are rich and the many who are poor. Now, what happens after the Civil War is that the banks prevail upon the federal government not to go back to the bimetal silver and gold standard, but to go back to the gold standard. Nothing but gold, that's gonna be the standard. That deflates the currency. Now, what happens next? Who's, who are the many who are poor in the 1890s? It's the farmers. The nature of the farming business is what? You harvest your crops at the, in, the, in the fall. You have enough um, food to pay uh, to feed your family and you have enough food to sell at market. At the, end of the, at the end of the winter though, you're running low on money and on supplies. So what do you need to do? You need to go to the bank and borrow money from the bank, right? If that money has suddenly de has suddenly become if a dollar is 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 if the dollar the strength of the dollar is going up during the time between when you get the loan and the time you have to repay it see that then you're going to be paying more basically uh, to the bank you're you're you don't want that you want the money to inflate so what the the pot that you you get several uh, reform movements in the 1870s as early as the 1870s. There was um, 
um, the greenback party that wanted to go back to the old paper money greenback system, reinflate the currency so that the farmers would, uh, would be able to pay their loans back in inflated money. Right? There was also a, a, a farmers alliance. Those two movements coalesced into what was called the People's Party or the populists in the 1890s. The populists wanted uh, not just a gold standard, but a gold and silver standard. They wanted to reinflate the currency for the benefit of the many who are poor, who happen to be farmers in the Midwest and the, and the West. They also, in addition to that, they also were going after the idea that um, the bankers were too influential in the US Senate for the reasons I gave earlier, see? So the combination of wanting easy money, cheaper money, so to speak, for their, for their loans, plus democratization, right? Democratization of the Senate, uh, sticking it to the many who are rich, in other words, that was, um, that was, their, that was their program. And that's, that's, that they were one of the groups that, uh, su su that supported this. Uh, another uh, a very influential person who supported it was uh, William Randolph Hearst, who was the great newspaper editor who was portrayed in the uh, movie with Orson Welles, the Orson Welles movie. Um, and uh, he, uh, he, he, he uh, uh, editorialized in around 1906, started writing editorials in favor of democratic election of senators. And there are others who, uh, who were in favor of it too, but uh, basically that's the, that's the run up to the, that's, those are the pressures that were on the, um, uh, on the Senate and on the, on the uh, House of Representatives to pass this, uh, this joint resolution that they did pass in 1911 for the 17th Amendment. And that seems like a generalization, really, uh, not what you're saying, but just, just in what they were thinking, that all state legislators were being manipulated by bankers, you know? Was yeah. that really true? Um, it was not, not as much as they were claiming, you know, it's one of the, it's a typical political argument, right? Each side exaggerates <laughs> on behalf of itself, right? Um, the man who opposed this was uh, Senator Elihu Root. Um, he was a, um, he was a very long live man. Uh, he was born in 1845 and he died in 1937. And uh, he was wow. a senator. Yeah, he was a senator, um, um, for a number of, uh, for, for just one term. And he was, he was, he, he disliked this because he didn't like the idea of having a direct democracy. He wanted Republic, small r Republican government, which means government by representatives. He wanted the old, the, the, the existing federal system whereby the states were influential. And uh, basically he said that um, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the people uh, very often don't elect any better representatives than the, than the state legislators do. So, you know, what's, what's going to be really the difference here? And it removes the incentive to, to uh, select really good uh, senators. For example, if you're an elected, if you're, if you're a state senator or a state uh, House of Representatives person, uh, you kind of know who is a, who is going to be an effective representative for your state in the national government. You have a sense, most groups have a sense of who's really good at doing what we do and who isn't so good. And you're going to, you have an, a strong incentive to want the best, send the best person to Washington. First of all, because you want a voice in Washington that's strong. And second of all, you get rid of him on your level, right? <laughs> you, we mediocrities can take over now. So there's a there's a double incentive there, and uh, uh, basically um, the and the, then the idea oh the idea the other thing was that this these delays on uh, when the when the legislatures were deadlocked remember that was one of the things they wanted to get rid of that uh, what was the state legislature was deadlocked uh, there would be a delay in in in, in getting us a, a US senator um, he said all you have to do with that is just repeal that 1866 law that required majority uh, majorities to elect uh, US senators in the state houses see that so so that's so because if, if if it were majorities it would be the party that was ruling uh, had the majority, you know, let's say the Democrats had the majority, they'd be sending the legislators, right. the two legislators, more yeah, likely they would win. If it's Republican, 
uh, they would be sitting. Now, today you have more of a chance of having a Republican and a Democrat, perhaps, Senator, than just sometimes right. you see that. You have one. That's right. That's um, that's uh, the, the sacrifice you make is that the um, the senators are no longer so beholden to the state governments. And I'll give you an example. I'll, I'll, sh I'll tell you, I'll show you why that's the case. Let's say um, I'm a U.S. Senator from Illinois and Tova Kaplan is uh, a member of the state legislature. Legislator Kaplan wants something from the U.S. Senate. So she calls my office. If, if we're under the old system, whereby I owe my election to the 177 members of the Illinois state legislature. Am I gonna pick up the phone and deal with her personally? Probably so. If I'm available, because there are only 177 votes that I have to worry about to get elected and reelected. However, if, if it's the, uh, how many, there are about 12.7 million people in Illinois, right? So let's say half of them are eligible to vote. I don't know what percentage can actually vote, but let's say 6 million or so can vote. She's, she's suddenly one in 6 million. Do I pick up the phone or do I have some staffer deal with her? The answer is probably the staffer. See, that, that's the difference. That's the difference. That's really, really interesting. Um, I'm going to I'm like, Kathy asked her question, but I have a, a, a generalization of what, what you just said, which I thought was interesting. So would you say the 17th Amendment, I know that our government is a republic, but it seems like the 17th Amendment made, made our government more of a democracy than a, a, of a republic, of, yes. even though we still are electing. Um, define that just a little bit more. Yes, um, here's the deal. The populists want to democratize the government as much as possible. It's still gonna have elected representatives, so it will be a republic, but they want it to be as much of a democratic republic as possible. And that's why they don't want the banks to control the legislatures and then indirectly control the US Senate. See what I'm saying? So, but it's not just the populists. You know, I, I, I left out something that's very important. The populists, after all, didn't succeed. Right. They, elect, they, they ran um, um, William Jennings Bryan and some of these other guys for, for, for the presidency, but they never, they, never, they never won. And the Democratic Party, as long as the, 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 some of the populists joined the Democratic Party, especially uh, when Bryan ran against McKinley in 1896. Um, and so they, they, the populists kind of fizzled out, but the group that replaced them was the progressives. The populists' basic problem was this. They had the farmers vote in their hip pocket all along. What they couldn't do, what they never were really good at, was appealing to the large number of people who were urban factory workers. Urban factory workers. Because they were farmers. You know, the cultural differences between uh, urban factory workers who are mostly immigrants, recent immigrants from, from Europe, and so and 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 uh, and Native American, not Native American in the sense of the American Indians, but uh, born in America, farm uh, farmers was too great to bridge that divide. What the progressives did was to get a coalition going of the urban workers with the farmers. See, and that was what allowed someone like William uh, Woodrow Wilson to win in 1912, and it's what uh, got the uh, coalition, a big enough coalition, to get these various progressive amendments through. The amendments had been formulated by the populists long, uh, years before, but the progressives actually got them through. And there's a big difference that's important for, for, for Tova and, and all younger people to see between the progressives and the previous political groupings in the United States, whether they're populists or the American founders or the Republican Party when Lincoln was around. No matter, the, the, as you know, the, the uh, founders based the, 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 the Constitution on natural rights, didn't they? unalienable natural rights. And they say in the declaration that, the, that governments are intended to secure your natural rights. That's what your civil rights are intended to do. They're laws that back up your, your, your natural rights. The progressives have an entirely different uh, basis 
uh, for understanding moral and political right. Instead of saying that it's based on the laws of nature and of nature's God, rights now are based on what they consider to be the course of events, history defined as the course of events. And the idea is that history is always progressing. Human beings are always gaining greater and greater control over nature, see? And so when that happens, when you do that, then that's a, that's a philosophy that they imported from uh, Europe and particularly from Germany. There were philosophers who were rejecting natural right and, and going for this historical right. When you do that, right becomes, political and moral right becomes a moving target, doesn't it? It becomes the latest thing. Whatever the trend is, is right, because history is giving that to you. That's what, that's what the trend is. And so as a result, what that means is that in, in a funny way, the progressives are democratizing in one, on, on one hand, right? They're democratizing. But on the other hand, they're empowering the central government more and more. Do you see that? You see that dichotomy? The more the central government controls, the more you have a bureaucracy or an administrative state. And uh, you also have the idea of uh, the, the, the uh, president as the leader of the country, meaning he's at the cutting edge of history, telling us where the next step of history is going to be. So you have the progressives have this very odd combination of democracy on the one hand, and then leadership and also bureaucracy on the other. Because what's bureaucracy? Is not bureaucracy just another government of the few? Only instead of having private bankers and financial guys and corporate guys being the few who are rich, now it's the government that's rich and the administrators get to administer all the money that they're collecting from the rest of us. See that? So well, the danger, yeah, I'm gonna go to Kathy. And the, the danger of, of having it from progressing away from unalienable rights that come from our creator is and if you're moving with history, suddenly your government is giving you your rights. Yeah. And then the government can take rights away. And we talk about that a lot in, in the speeches that I give is that, you know, we're, our creator, we're born with these rights. And as soon as the government gets to be bigger and powerful and you're, you're a moving target, you don't have a foundation anymore, you don't have any core belief, then all of a sudden you're going to turn to the government as your creator. Okay, Kathy, yeah. I know you're interested, you're fascinated, you want to talk. So, Kathy, go ahead. Well, and I hope my internet connection is strong enough here. Okay. Um, but thank you, Dr. Morrissey. This has just been fascinating. What, what I wanted to ask is, was there a noticeable shift in the type of legislation that, that began to come out of the Congress after the chain, after the 17th Amendment? Did, you, did they find that, for instance, were there more unfunded mandates put on states that maybe states would have, would have opposed if they had still been able to have more control over who their representatives were in the Senate? Yes, but not immediately. Don't forget, um, in the 1920s saw a, a pushback against statism and against this, I'll call the, the, the business of historical right, I'll call that historicism. It's the doctrine of historicism. There was a pushback against historicist uh, thought and also against big, big government, right? You had Calvin Coolidge, in the 1920s, who was a natural rights guy and a small government guy, and Hoover following him. It was only when the New Deal started that you really start getting uh, a more centralized government. And even then, if you recall, the Democratic Party coalition that elected Roosevelt had that uh, Southern, uh, the, the Southern states behind it. The Solid South voted for the Democrats because the Solid South, South still remembered the Civil War, which they regarded as a Republican Party attack on them, right? So they, um, so they were a kind of break on, on, on government centralization for a long time. But gradually you get more and more centralized government, more and more compromise of the states uh, the state's uh, legitimate, what had been their legitimate constitutional rights. But you don't really get that until uh, maybe 40 or 50 years after the amendment was passed. It's a very long term uh, thing. That's, uh, it's an un it, it may or may not have been an unintended consequence. I don't think it was an unintended consequence. I think the progressives wanted to centralize the government. And uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson, for example, had written when he was a uh, 
college professor at Johns Hopkins back in the 1870s, as far back as then, he wrote a very influential paper on what he called the administrative state, where he advocated this European style uh, bureaucratic state for America. And uh, this was gradually instituted. The first big cut on it was the New Deal. And then, of course, in the 1960s, the Great Society programs of Lyndon Johnson and uh, so on. Tova, do you have a question? Um, yes, I do. So I was wondering, obviously, this amendment greatly changed the way that senators would, would campaign for their jobs, but could you go more into the specifics of how it changed, like the art of campaigning in general? Um, mm -hmm. how, did, how did senators have to change their ideas in the way that they campaigned to reach out to the everyday person rather than a group of uh, very specific demographic of electors who would have previously chosen them? Well, um, first of all, you don't forget now, you also at this time, you're starting to get new communications technologies, aren't you? Um, suddenly you're starting to get radio, right? Radio is coming in uh, very quickly. Um, so what you're getting is more and more senators, the senators have to go around campaigning around the state more. They have to do more speeches. They need to spend more money on, um, on campaign literature because they need to get get into the doorway, right? They get need to get something into the household. And uh, eventually they're going to need more uh, radio time. They're gonna to need to buy radio time. So what happens is what money comes back anyway, doesn't it? Because you have to pay for all of this. Well, who's gonna pay for it? The many who are poor? I don't think so, they're poor. So, so, so you get, uh, so you get this, uh, uh, I don't have to tell Kathy Gillespie about lobbyists in Washington, DC and fundraising in Washington, DC, right? That's, a, that's an industry now. And that's what you get over time. The, the great, um, the great uh, pro, uh, protagonist of this, or uh, the great practitioner, I should say, of direct communication with the people was not a US Senator so much as a US President. And that was Franklin Roosevelt. In the early 1930s, there were two men who understood what radio could do. Uh, in the 20s, typically when radio first came, became popular, uh, radio announcers thought of themselves, they imagined themselves as addressing this huge audience in an auditorium. And so they would say things like, ladies and gentlemen of the listening audience, this is such so-and-so uh, giving you the, uh, the, the, the uh, band, the jazz band of the day, right? Or whatever it was, right? They, they'd address, they were like stentorian orators. They were like William Jennings Bryan, who was a, who, who, uh, was a great orator for a crowd of people. You had to have a, 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 a voice that would carry in a crowd. And they took that right into the radio station. What, there were two people who understood that wasn't true. The first one, was a man named Arthur Godfrey. Do you know who Arthur Godfrey was? I asked that question, I've taught for 15 years at Hillsdale College. I asked that question every semester to my American foreign policy class. Who was Arthur Godfrey? Not one student knew who Arthur Godfrey was. Now, some of our older uh, participants, not Lisa, she doesn't know who Arthur Godfrey was, but some of our uh, more uh, seasoned participants know exactly who Arthur Godfrey was. He was one of the most famous men in America in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Everybody in my generation would have known who Arthur Godfrey was. He was the radio guy who, who got sick one time. He was very desperately ill for a long time, and he was lying in a hospital bed listening to the radio, and he listened to these guys on the radio, and they'd be saying, ladies and gentlemen of the... And he thought to himself, I'm not a lady or gentleman of the listening audience. I'm just a guy alone in a hospital bed. And I'm listening to this other person on the radio. When he got back on the radio, he started talking to people as if he was talking one-on-one. -on -one. It's a conversational medium. It's one of the most personal mediums that is nonetheless a mass medium at the same time. The other man who understood that was Franklin Roosevelt. 
Franklin Roosevelt instituted the, or the fireside chat radio programs where he would address Americans family as if he was talking to them in their living room. They had those big old fashioned radio sets that were the kind of the centerpiece of the, of the living room. The family would gather around and listen to President Roosevelt giving his homey, nice fireside chat on the radio, talking directly to them. See, that's, that's how campaigning changes. But it, does it still requires money. It still requires money. And uh, uh, they, that's, what, that's the one thing the progressives did not foresee. So now they're not beholden to state uh, legislators, the 17, you know, the 17 state legislatures. They're beholden to the 17 corporations that gave them money. Exactly. You know? this, well, the other thing is, is, sure, is pretty and, similar. And, and get this though, they, the whole complaint was that those legislatures had been bought by the, by the money bags guys, right? But the money bags guys come right back in. It's hard to stop money from circulating around if you have somebody that the money guy, something that the money guys want to buy. You still have to have money. I was telling Juliet this morning, you know, it's just, it's just the government doesn't get, it's just, yeah. Okay, Kathy, would you like to ask a, a, almost a final question? Professor Morsi, look at all my notes. <laughs> I love everything you've had to say today. I think I might have to be one of your seasoned people that goes to Hillsdale College. It <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like to listen to you all day long. All right, Kathy. Well, we had an interesting question from a member of our audience. David Edelman asked, to what extent were there discussions about the role of other middlemen, like electors, in adoption of the policy of the direct election of senators? In other, in other words, did they consider any sort of a compromise, like, like maybe having electors instead of having the state legislatures? Or was it really an either or? No, it was an either or. I don't, I don't, I don't know that any uh, idea of having a kind of electoral college for, for senators was ever done. The electoral college is another idea, though, that is a, a, a filter between pure democracy and republicanism, isn't it? It's, a, it's, it's, it's the presidential equivalent of having state legislators because it's a state by state process and it respects the integrity of the states, which is why a lot of uh, modern day progressives would like to get rid of it and just have a straight majority vote uh, nationwide. You know, Professor Morrissey, I give, uh, I've given over, I guess, about 500 speeches to kids and, and I walk them through the First Amendment, how those are the tools of the toolbox and, and how, to, how to write a petition and how to actually be a part of the government instead of letting the government do, you know, every, really, they learn sort of by rote, but they don't really understand how to be a part of it, you know, how to engage in it. But one of the things I talk about is the midterm election as opposed to the election every four years for the president. And what's really interesting for me to always see, and I think perhaps the 17th Amendment had a lot to do with this and this movement, is that when you said this earlier, is the shift that the president has become the most important person. And really, you know, I think that's, I really hadn't heard that in correlation. I just, I just teach I teach the kids that if they want to change something about their neighborhood or their government, their, that their house representative they can actually talk to, you know, if that person's right there in their district and the president you can't talk to. But it's interesting because we never wanted a dictator or a king or a, a, that, can get, that can turn into a Hitler or God knows what, you know. We, we wanted a, a, a government that had equal powers, you know. We didn't want this strong central figure. And if you look at our elections today, hundreds of millions of people show up to vote for the, the presidential election and minuscule amounts sh show up for the, the midterm election. So I think that's proving the point right there of the direction of people thinking that, that they really want more like a king to over, it's just kind of strange to me. Here's, here's another thing for that. This is the importance of federalism. You have, a, you have what Madison calls an extended republic, right? A very, a, a republic over a big piece of territory with a large population. How are you going to do that if you have citizens who aren't really citizens anymore? In other words, if people, if, if the local governments, if the state, county, and municipal governments become less and less important in the overall federal system, 
then people are not going to want to bother running for city council or school board or state legislature or county commissioner or whatever whatever the these 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 positions are you're, and you're going to have people who are no longer really participating in citizenship they're no longer learning to be citizens at the local level before they move on to the to the the federal level the national level see that whole civic spirit of americans uh, degenerates when you have a centralized and bureaucratized government that takes over everything whether it's a government, whether it's the federal government, or some of the state governments, um, uh, the Michigan government in Lansing, which is the state capital, and probably Illinois has a very centralized um, uh, state government now. And they take away powers and responsibilities from the lower levels of government. And that, those, are the, those are the training grounds for citizenship. See, because then it's meaningful. If you if 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 your if your local government has real power and real authority and real responsibility, then it's meaningful to run for office on the local level. But if it's not no longer meaningful, why bother? Why pay attention? Why do anything? See, and that well, sets, also yeah. the citizen themselves yeah. feels empowered. Yeah, if you yeah. feel empowered. Yeah, like you can make a difference. Or something right. if if you feel you like you fit into one in three hundred fifty million people you feel like you don't have a voice anymore and you can't make a difference. But, you know, we can't really fit into that 350 million, but we can fit into the, maybe the, the 30,000 or the 3,000 or the 30, you know, right here in my country, you know, the, the local neighborhood. There's something really right. magic, really beautiful about that. That was the Democracy in America by... Tocqueville, uh, Alexis Cox. Tocqueville. Yes, Tocqueville says that Americans, unlike Europeans, are real citizens. They're at all levels of government and they're very jealous of their citizenship rights. That gradually erodes uh, with these late 19th century and early 20th century developments in, uh, in American politics. Fascinating. Uh, so we go from uh, being a citizen to being, um, what a would subject. be the antithesis of being a citizen? What's that? A subject. A subject. A subject. Oh my God, that's so good. Subject to the king. Yes, you go from being a citizen to a subject. Oh my goodness, I've learned so much today. That's just fantastic. I we thank well, you so here. so much. If you come to Hillsdale College, I want you to bring my favorite mother, your mother, with you. I met her at Mount Vernon, and uh, and I I really liked her. We got along just fine. Because I oh a gosh. very good role model for her daughter. <laughs> you just made her day, Professor Morrissey, if she's still on. My mother will be happy the rest of the day. Okay, when I come, I'll bring my mother. How's that? Okay, very okay. good. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening today. Thank you to our donors who are listening today. This is how this whole thing happens. It's how, how it works. Okay, bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Morrissey. Okay, so long.